today we're going to be continuing in our series. We're going to be in week seven today of follow me, what it means to follow Jesus. And before we go any further, I just want to say, can we, can we give God some more praise this morning for the incredible worship? Absolutely. I don't know about you, but as some old time preachers used to say, if that don't get your fire started, your wood's wet. And uh, I don't know, that was, man, that, that last song, whew, that just, uh, that got me. But um, today we're going to be in, in week seven of, of Follow Me, and we're going to be talking about something that I think is something we all admire in other people, but it's something we struggle with if we're honest. And we're going to be talking about humility. Um, what it looks like to follow Jesus is one of the things is humbling ourselves. And in his earthly ministry, Jesus attempted to instill in his disciples what the attitude of a servant was and what that looked like. And, and humility and a willingness to put others ahead of oneself. That was one of the, the primary focuses that Jesus tried to instill in his disciples during his earthly ministry was to put others ahead of oneself. Jerry Bridges in his book, The Blessing of Humility, says that in the Greco-Roman world of Paul's day, humility was a despised trait. They viewed it as a sign of weakness. And the culture that you and I live in today is really no different from that world of over 2,000 years ago. Maybe it's a little different in our Christian circles. We may even admire humility in someone else, but we have little desire to practice it ourselves. And that's kind of a true statement. We admire humility in other people, but when it comes to us being humble, a lot of times that's easier said than done if we're being real this morning. But before we go any further, let's, let's define exactly what is humility. What does it mean to be humble? Well, humble is, is two different ways we can look at it. <clears throat> it can be used as an adjective. And as an adjective, to be humble means not proud or arrogant. It means modest. Having a feeling of insignificance, inferiority, or subservience means low in rank, importance, status, quality, lowly. It also means courteously respectful. As a verb, it, it means to lower in condition. Importance or dignity means to abase. It also means to destroy the independence, power, or will of. And so when we think about being humble, um, it means that we're not arrogant. We're not proud. It means we have a modest opinion or estimation of ourselves. It means that we don't think that we're more important than we really are. It also means that, that we destroy the independence or the power or the will of our flesh and we, we humble ourselves. Today we're going to be in Philippians chapter number 2. And this is the greatest passage that I can possibly think of talking about humility and what it looks like to be a humble follower and servant of Jesus. And so Philippians chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse number 1, and we're going to read down through verse 11. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1, here's what the word of the Lord says. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interest of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now before we move any further dealing with our text today, there's a couple of things that, that I really want us to, to walk away today with uh, and, and just 
a couple things that, that I really believe are important for us to grasp, grasp excuse me, when we think about humility. And this is the first thing. The biggest threat to the church today is not from the sin of the unbelieving world around us, but rather from the sin of professing Christians from within us. I'm going to say that again. The biggest threat to the church today is not from the sin of the world, of the unbelieving world around us, but rather it is from the sin of professing Christians within us. Okay. Meaning that we don't have to, to look at the unbelieving world around us as a threat to, to the church. And, and I'm afraid in American Christianity, we've gotten this idea that the world around us somehow is, is the problem. And, and that's not really the case. The greatest problem that we as the church have today is within our four walls. It's us. It's our own human hearts. It, it's the sin that resides in my heart and in your heart. That's the biggest threat that we have today is to that. And the second thing I want us to, to walk away with today is this. There has never been a greater need than there is now for followers of Jesus to walk in humility. There's never been a greater need than there is now for followers of Jesus to walk in humility. And why is that? Because selfishness just is all around us in our culture. If you don't believe that, just turn on the news for a little bit. Just watch what's happening in the world around us. And it's a result of selfishness. It's a result of, of people wanting things to be about them and wanting to have their way and not caring about anybody else. And so there's never been a greater need now for you and I as followers of Jesus to rise up and to walk in a spirit of humility. And so we must do those things. And if we can get a hold of that, if we can realize that, that no matter how bad the world around us gets, no matter what happens in our nation, no matter what happens around the world, that it doesn't matter because in the end of the story, we know that our God is victorious. We know that we have the victory and that nothing will ever come against Jesus' church. He even says the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. So it doesn't matter what happens. But the problem is, is that we, just like Rome fell from within, we as the church are destroying ourselves from within because of the sin that is within us, the pride that is within us, the lack of humility that is within us. And so I want us to, to work our way through the text that we just read as Paul is writing to the church at Philippi and he's encouraging them of uh, what it looks like to walk in humility. He's encouraging them what it looks like to, to walk in unity. And, and so today, I believe that there is not a greater time than there is right now for us to heed the words of the Apostle Paul and for us to walk in a spirit of humility. And as we said, this is something when we, we talk about others being humble, we admire that. We look at that and we say, oh, that is so great. They are so humble. But let's be real. That is so hard for us to live out and for us to accomplish. And in fact, a lot of times, let's just be real too. We don't want to be humble because, you know, we're selfish. We like being selfish and our culture caters to being selfish. And, and those of us who are only children, we, we even know this greater because we didn't have to share our toys with anybody growing up. And we didn't have to play nice with anybody because it was just me, myself, and I. And it was, that was great. But we have to fight against this spirit of pride and selfishness that wars within our souls every day. And we have to adopt a spirit of humility. So let's jump into the text and let's talk about what it looks like to walk in humility and to humble ourselves. Number one is this, remembering what happened when we came to Christ is the foundation for humbling ourselves. Remembering what happened when we came to Christ is the foundation for humbling ourselves. Paul as he's beginning this, this chapter and he's writing to the, the Philippians, he says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, he says, if any fellowship with the Spirit, any, if there's any affection and mercy. He's saying, think back to when you first encountered Jesus. Think back to when you first came to faith. And so when you and I remember the supernatural work of Jesus in our lives, it removes any possible reason for you 
and for me to be prideful at all. Because when I think about what Jesus has accomplished in my heart and in my life, I have no grounds to be prideful. Because I can't look at someone else and and look down my nose at them because of the sin in their life or because they sin differently from me because I am in the same boat they are in. There's an old saying, it says, but by the, but for the grace of God, so go we. Meaning that if it wasn't for God's grace in my life, I, I could be anywhere and I could be anybody. And there is nothing that is beyond my capability of, of sinning, but for the grace of God. And so when I think about that supernatural work of Jesus in my own heart and my life, and when I think about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, as, as we sing about just a few moments ago, when he stretched his arms out and he sacrificed his life and he laid down his life and he shed his blood for our sin. And, and, and the Father applied <clears throat> that blood to my account when I trusted Christ and placed my faith and trust in his finished work on the cross. It's not because there was any merit in me, not because I'm good, not because I'm deserving, but because he is faithful, he is merciful, and he is good. That is the only reason why I have eternal life. And so when I think about that, I cannot, <coughs> excuse me, be prideful. So we need to understand that we were and we are loved, <coughs> excuse me, unconditionally by Christ who gave his life for us. When I think about that, <clears throat> when I think about his love for me unconditionally, I, I can't be prideful. I can't think that that I'm worthy. I can't think that I'm deserving. Excuse me. I can't think that there's any good in me apart from Jesus. I love what Tim Keller says about this. He says, the Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me. Yet I'm so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. This leads to deep humility and deep confidence at the same time. It undermines both swaggering and sniveling. I cannot feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. I do not think more of myself nor less of myself. Instead, I think of myself less. As believers, you and I have shared and are sharing in the experience of being Objects and being the objects of God's compassion. <clears throat> Excuse me. And God's tender care of you and me, when we think about that, should lead us and move us to care for the interests of others and to serve sacrificially. And so when we think about God's love, that He is that good, good Father, yep. you and I cannot do anything but respond in humility and respond <clears throat> in a lowliness of mind. We can't be proud about anything. We can't look at the Father and say that we are deserving, that we are worthy. But only because of Jesus can we be accepted, can we be made worthy. And so remembering what happened when we came to Christ is the foundation for humbling ourselves. Let me give you the second thing. Humbling ourselves means we consider others to be more important than our own desires and ambitions. Humbling ourselves means, excuse me, we consider others to be more important than our own desires and ambitions. Look in verses three and four. Paul says this. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. He says, or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, He says, but also for the interests of others. Think about that for just a moment. Paul's saying, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or conceit. Don't just be focused on yourself. Not just what you're interested in. Look out for what other people are interested in. But this right here is completely contrary to how the culture around us lives. This is completely contrary to what we're inundated with day after day from the media, from social media, from from even within the church a lot of times. We're inundated with this stuff. Think about how many of our current problems in the world that are going on, whether they're outside of the church or within the church. Think of how many of our current problems are related to our conceit and our selfishness. 
Let's just be real about that. All the problems that, that, that we see in, in, our, in our world right now can be traced back to just being conceited and being selfish. And if you don't believe me, like I said, turn the news on and let's just watch how people that are grown, that are, I mean, basically in, you know, have been in this world for 60 or 70 years and should be some of, you know, the most wise people that we have because of how many years they've lived and the lives they've lived. And yet there's some of the the, the dumbest people in a lot of ways, and it's our elected officials. And we look at how they, they, they interact with each other, and it's like it doesn't. And I'm not here to, to make a political statement. I'm just saying that it's because they're selfish, and it's about what they want, and it's not about us. It's about like what they want, and it's the same. And, and before we start saying, yeah, that's right, yeah, they're just they're terrible. You and I are the same oh, way. Right. We're the same way. We want it to be about us, and, and and it's like you know we read things and we we start wanting to pick up those stones and throw them, but. I'm selfish and I'm conceited a lot of times because guess what? I like things to be about me. And if you're honest, you like things to be about you too. But that's why so, where so many of our problems come from is because we're selfish. And you and I must all be aware of the presence of selfishness in our lives. We've got we've to realize that it's real and we've got to see it for what it is. And we've got to daily seek to put it to death and to nail it to the cross. We've got to crucify that daily. And here's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 through 26. He says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. He says, Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. And so Paul's saying that daily... We must nail our passions and our desires to the cross. Daily, we must crucify our flesh. And guess what? Every day I get up, I have to remind myself, it's not about me. You know where a lot of times we go, we go wrong in the church and where we get into trouble? And this is why so many churches have disunity and, and why they fight and they fuss is because everybody within the church thinks it's about them and they forget it's about Jesus. And, and it's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about the gospel and I've shared this with so many people because we do so much work with church revitalization and replanting. And, and, and I see this so much in churches that are dying. And, and a lot of times what happens is people, they forget who it's about. And, and they, they lose sight of that. And because they lose sight of the mission and they lose sight of the fact that it's about Jesus, all of a sudden they, they focus on all the things that don't matter. And they get hung up on that. And when we lose sight of the mission and we lose sight of Jesus... We're in really bad shape. But when we think about nailing uh, this to the cross and crucifying our selfishness every day, I love what author John Stott says about this. He says that at every stage of our Christian development and in every sphere of our Christian discipleship, he says pride is the greatest enemy and humility our greatest friend. See, pride is, is the root really of all sin. Every sin that we can commit is rooted in pride because that was what the original sin, when we think about when uh, the Garden of Eden, what originally plunged humanity into a fallen state was, it was pride. Literally, Eve wanting to be like God and, and Eve wanting to have something that, that she was never intended to have and, and she thought, wow, this would be great. That was what caused Satan to fall. It, originally from heaven when he was uh, one of the, the chief uh, musicians in heaven and he was one of the angels known as Lucifer. And what caused him to fall? It was pride. Because he says, I will be like God. I will be like the Most High. Pride gets us in so much trouble because it makes things about us. And so it's our greatest enemy. But, it's, but humility is our greatest friend. And humbling ourselves means that you and I must consider others to be more important than our own desires and ambitions. Uh, Let's think about this for just a moment. We see this lived out every day when, in, in the relationship and, and the institution of marriage. Because when two people come together and, and a husband and a wife join in the covenant of marriage with, with, with that covenant with God, if they don't consider the spouse to, to be more important than their own desires and their ambitions and, and they don't put them ahead of their own selves, it, it's never going to work. There's always going to be this and when we do that in our relationship with God and, and we, we make it more about us and what we desire 
our relationship with God is going to be the same way. And when we do that within the church and we make things about us and our desires and our ambitions, then all of a sudden within the church, it's like this because we're butting heads all the time. And so humbling ourselves means that we put others ahead of ourselves. And it also means that daily we have to recognize selfishness in ourselves and and we have to crucify it and nail it to the cross. Number three, humbling ourselves is the foundation of unity in the church. Humbling ourselves is the foundation of unity in the church. And let me just say, there will never ever be unity in a church congregation apart from people walking in humility. There will never be unity in a church congregation apart from people walking in humility. And so humility is the foundation to having unity. And and so many times we we look at churches and and the world looks at at the church, you know, and they they think, wow, they it's just a bunch of people fighting and fussing and arguing and all that stuff. And and why is that? Because we refuse to humble ourselves. Because we're selfish, because we're prideful, because we want to have our way. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing to the churches at Rome, says this in Romans 12, 16. He says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Meaning, you know, don't think you really know more than you know. Don't think you're more important than you really are. And he says, don't be proud, but instead associate with the humble. And so... Humble people contribute to the unity of the church, but selfish people undermine the unity of the church. And so if we want to have unity within our church congregation, we've got to be humble. If we want to have, if we want to have the church to, to, to be divided and, and have tension, then guess what? All we have to do is be selfish and, 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 and say, I just want to have my way. I want it to be me, me, me. And that's why we have so many troubles in our nation and in our world. It's why we have trouble within our homes and trouble within in our uh, relationships. And it's why we see trouble in our leadership of our nation. It's why we see trouble around the world is because there's a lack of humility. Humble people contribute to the unity of the church. Selfish people undermine the unity of the church. So if we want to, to be unified as a church... If we want to to come together and we want to to be, you know, like this and and we want to be tight and we don't want anything to break that, we've got to learn to humble ourselves. We've got to learn to realize that it's not about us. It's not about our preferences. It's not about our wants and our ambitions, but it's about Jesus. And it's about people coming to know Jesus and people experiencing life change through the power of the gospel. And when that's our, our mission then we, we unify around that and we humble ourselves and, and we say it's about him. It's not about me. Let me give you the fourth thing. When we think about humbling ourselves, Jesus is the example of what humbling ourselves looks like. Jesus is the example of what humbling ourselves looks like. Look at verse 5 as we, we look at verses 5 through 11. Paul admonishes and encourages the Philippians. He says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. He says this, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited or some translations that say as something to be grasped, something to cling to. Or as the old King James would say, he did not consider it uh, it robbery to, to be equal with God. And it says, instead, he emptied himself By assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And it says, and when he had come as a man, it says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. And it says, for this reason, God highly exalted and gave him the name that is above every name. And that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. So Jesus is the example that even though he was the image of the invisible God, that he was God himself, it says that he existed in the form of God and he did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited or to take advantage of, to hold on to, but he emptied himself. He emptied out every bit of himself 
And it says, not only did he empty himself, it says by assuming the form of a servant. And then it says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. So he, he literally lays down his divinity. He lays down every claim he has in that moment. And he lays that aside. And it says that he takes on the form of a human being. And Jesus lowers himself to be part of his creation. And he takes on the form of a human and the form of a servant. And it says that he humbled himself and he became obedient. And so here's what we need to grasp and here's what we need to wrap our minds around. That Jesus could have come down off the cross at any moment he wanted to. There was absolutely nothing apart from Jesus' love that was holding him to the cross. I mean, Jesus could have at any moment stepped down. But yet he knew that was the only way that it was possible to redeem you and me. He knew that apart from him staying on that cross that we would be without hope and that we would never, ever be forgiven of our sins, that our sins would never be uh, not only atoned for, but they would be blotted out because of his sacrifice. And it was Jesus' love that, that kept him there because he could have called upon his father and his father would have sent legions of angels and he could have just stepped down. But it says of Jesus that he gave, when he cried out with a loud voice, he gave up the ghost. He didn't have his life taken. He laid it down. He gave up his life. And Jesus is the example of the mindset that you and I should have. That we don't need to hang on to, there are things, and we're going to talk about this more next week, and I'm just, I'm going to tell you, I, Next week might be kind of rough when we, we, we wrap up this series as we think about what it looks like to follow Jesus. But one of the things in American culture that, that I think we struggle with, and this is a hard truth for us, is that our rights as Americans are often doing this with what Jesus calls us to as citizens of his kingdom. Meaning there are a lot of times in America, yes, we are granted certain rights as Americans, but it doesn't mean that it's always right for us to exercise those rights. Because a lot of times when we say, well, I have this right. Yes, we do as Americans, but it undermines our walk with Jesus. It undermines our testimony for Jesus. And there are a lot of times that we just need to humble ourselves and say, you know what? I might have this right, but I'm going to lay it aside because the gospel is more important and Jesus is more important. And it's more important that people see what it looks like to live as a citizen of Jesus' kingdom than to live as a citizen of America. And I know that's not popular for us to, to, to do that because we like to be patriotic in America, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is there's so many times that, that those two things are at conflict, and we try to marry the two together. And when they're at odds, what are we going to do? We're called to Jesus' kingdom first and foremost. And so when we think about Jesus humbling himself and he laid stuff aside, there are so many things that I'm going to encourage us, and I don't want to run too much of a rabbit trail, but I want to encourage us, we need to lay aside for the sake of the gospel because it's more important that people come to know Jesus and it's more important that people experience life change through the gospel than it is for us to have our rights. But in America, we struggle with that. And yet... I can't help but wonder if it's why we see so little of God moving in this nation and we see God moving in amazing ways in communist countries, in Muslim countries where the gospel is illegal because we see people saying, I'm going to surrender everything and give my all in my entire life for the sake of the gospel. And yet as Americans, we're not even willing to sacrifice a small right here and there because of Jesus, because it's our right. And I know that's hard but I'm going to be honest, Jesus has been working in my heart and my life about this. And the more I read the Gospels, the more I read the New Testament, the more I realize that I'm going to be really honest. This is a lot of where we're struggling to reach people in our culture today is because we're not humbling ourselves. We're, we're, we're making it about us. And we're not laying down ourselves and sacrificing our lives. But Jesus gives us the example and the mindset of what we should have and the humility we should pursue and what it truly looks like to consider the needs of others. I'm going to tell you, like we've talked about this a lot, the last two years in just life have been hard. 
But the last two years have revealed how selfish we really are. The last two years have revealed how little we think of our, our fellow man. And, and how when it comes down to it, it's, it's about us. As long as I look out for me, that's all that matters. But Jesus shows us what it lo- looks like truly to consider the needs of others. So let's wrap this up. When we think about humility and we think about humbling ourselves. And as followers of Jesus, humility is to uh, characterize our lives. Humility is to what we're to, be, we're to be known for being humble. We're to known for our giving, our loving. We're not to think more highly of ourselves than we should. or We're not to exalt ourselves above others. In fact, Jesus doesn't say that, that the thing that's going to tell other people that we're his disciples is having the right doctrine or having the right theology or taking a stand for our rights. He says the thing that's going to identify us to the world that we are his followers and his disciples is our love for one another. And it's our, <clears throat> it's our love that's going to identify us. See, the early church, they did so many things that identified them and st- made them stand out from the culture around them. <clears throat> I want to share, <clears throat> excuse me, from Luke chapter 18. It's, it's, it's not on the screen. It's not in your handout. But just listen to these verses in Luke 18 verses 9 through 14. Jesus is, <clears throat> is telling this parable to people who thought they were self-righteous and people who were trusting in their own goodness. And here's what he said in verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest. Literally, it would be like he's beating his chest like this, saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Think about that Pharisee. How many times have we caught ourselves thinking that in our own head? And we might not have vocally said it. God, I'm sure thankful I ain't like all these other heathens out here. Man, I'm thankful I'm not like these other people. Bunch of heathen, reprobate, compromising. Man, I'm, we, you know, we might not say that, but we, we think that. Let's just be real. Notice what he says. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Hey, I'm not greedy. I'm not unrighteous. I'm not an adulterer. And I'm not even like this tax collector, as the old King James would say. I'm not like this sinner. And we look at people and we say, man, I I might have my stuff. I might have my junk. But man, I tell you, I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm not as messed up as they are. And you know what? The truth is, yes, you are. Yes, I am. We are just as jacked up and messed up as they are. The problem is we don't realize it. And notice, as as that Pharisee standing there, how many times he uses the word I? I. I do this, I do that, I don't do this. But the tax collector stood afar off and he wouldn't even so much as look to heaven. And he's striking his chest saying, God have mercy on me, a sinner, because he knew his great need for God's mercy. And so here's the thing. When we think about who Jesus is, when we think about what he saved us from, when we think about what he's done in our lives, you and I have no other response, or we should have no other response than to humble ourselves. We should respond in no other way but humility and say, God, I tell you, I'm thankful for your grace in my life. And God, I'm thankful that you have worked in my life in this way. And God, I'm thank- you could even say, I'm thankful that you have protected me from maybe these sins or maybe those sins or, or this or that. God, I'm thankful for what you've, you've done and I'm thankful for who you are. Because apart from your grace in my life, I I am utterly without hope. And so when we think about who Jesus is and what he has saved us from, there is no other response in this world that we should have than that response of humbling ourselves. But you know what sadly we see happening in our culture? The church doesn't respond that way. Sadly, a lot of times people's view of Christianity is that we respond to, to what Jesus has done and who Jesus is with this. God, thank you for saving me. 
I'm so glad I'm not like that person. I'm so glad, God, I, I don't do this. I'm so glad I don't go here. And we, we focus on, God, I'm really glad I'm not like that person. I know I've got issues, but man, man, they really got issues. I might be messed up, but man, at least I, I'm not a drug addict or I'm not a drunk or, or, or I, I've not cheated on my spouse or I've not done this or what. And we, and we qualify sin. We kind of like, maybe I've done this level of sin, but I've not done this. Sin is sin. And we've got to not look down upon people. We don't need people. We don't need to judge people. People don't need for us to judge them. They need for us to come alongside them to step into their brokenness and step into their mess with humility and say, you know what? I'm going to walk with you through this. And I'm going to point you to Jesus who's going to walk with you through this. And I'm going to point you to Jesus who can change your life and change your circumstances and point you to a Jesus who, who can do what no one else can and not look at them like we're better than them, but look at them like, but for the grace of God, so go we. And so I don't know about you today, but I know in my own heart, in my own life, it's really easy for me to get prideful and it's really easy for me to start looking down on others because they sin differently than I do. And it's really easy for me to forget what Jesus has done in my heart and my life and who Jesus is. And it's really easy for me to get so focused on myself that I don't care anything about what's going on in the lives of others. But when I humble myself, when I follow the example of Jesus, it's not about me. It's about him. And then it's about others. And it's about me last. So I don't know where we are today. But I pray that we will respond to God in repentance and faith for our selfishness, our pride, and that we will humble ourselves before God today and ask him to give us by his strength, a spirit of humility, that we can live out the humility and the lowliness of Christ and that we can point others to him. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word today. God, I pray that you would open our hearts to the truth of your word. God, I pray that we might humble ourselves before you today. God, I pray that we would not be selfish people. God, I pray we would not be prideful people. I pray that we would be humble people, realizing that but apart from your grace, God, that could be us that's the drunk. It could be us that's the drug addict. It could be us that's addicted to pornography. It could be us, God, that that is living in a world of bad circumstances. God, apart from your grace in our lives, we are hopeless and we are helpless. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to respond today. God, just humbled by the fact you would extend grace to people like us. And, God, that we would live out that same grace and we would demonstrate that same humility to those, God, that are far from you today. And that, God, people would see Jesus in our lives and that they would see his love and his gentleness and his meekness and his humility. Help us to respond today in repentance and faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all worship together.